Hi, hello, I hope you're taking care of yourself. If you're new here, my name is Lexi. I don't know how to spend my free time doing anything other than rotting in my bed with a book. So this month I got through 12. We're gonna talk about them, they're right there. Okay, like we're gonna wrap them up. We're gonna say hi to my cat who has just hopped up onto my chair. That's why we're both here, okay? Like I get to pretend that my opinion matters for 10 to 30 minutes and you get to add two or three new titles to your already 700 book long TBR. I also just wanna disclaim real quick that this is not like a normal amount of books to read. If you have like hobbies or friends or literally anything else in your life, like I don't want you to feel bad for not reading as many books as a random girl on the internet. Like you have things to do with your time other than just laying face down in a dark room, okay? We're not the same and that's probably better for you. Sad, cat's gone. Anyways, I came prepared with some cozy fall energy to help bring in September. Um, There's tea in here. It's no. Oh my God, I just spilled it all over myself. Okay, well, <laughs> that's that's really embarrassing. But yeah, we're gonna be staying comfortable and cozy for this video as if it's not like 80 degrees outside. Don't worry about that, okay? Our time will come. Anyways, let's get started. No more stalling. This is a standard procedure wrap up. I'm not gonna spoil anything beyond what you can find in the back of the book. I would never disarm you with so much coziness and comfort and autumn energy only to flip around and jump scare you with a spoiler. Okay, okay, let's get started. You again. So this is an advanced review copy that I requested this month and it's coming out very soon. So buckle in, take some notes, ladies, because this is a gender bent reimagining of When Harry Met Sally. Yeah, you heard me. Okay, she said what she said. This book follows a young, dashing, like vaguely pretentious chef named Josh, who kind of gives like tall, sexy Carmi from the bear. I don't know if anybody else is into that, but it was a plus for me. And this man like hates all humans around him all of the time, but also believes in true love and soulmates. And this idea that one day he'll be cooking breakfast for the girl of his dreams. Wish that were me, you know? And his love interest is this girl named Ari, who is a bi-struggling comedian that has serious commitment problems and definitely does not believe in soulmates. Anyways, the two of them meet for the first time when they realize that they've been sleeping with the same woman, which tension, okay, like, can you spell messy? And they automatically have this like vague sense of antagonism with each other, which is only further soaked by them randomly continuing to meet up a couple more times over the course of the next decade until they meet one last time and the stars align and they're both recovering from these very messy breakups and they end up becoming friends. I saw a Goodreads review. If I can find it, I'll blow it up on the screen. But it described this book as like an Emily Henry novel if both of the people were worse and... <laughs> And that is just like so 100% accurate. Like both of these characters are kind of just awful and selfish in their own distinct ways. And I could see how some people could find that annoying, but I, as a representative of sometimes awful sacks of shit around the world, found it to be incredibly compelling. And their conflicts stem from them just kind of sucking instead of from random plot conveniences or just like ways that the narrative is contrived to pull them apart. So the resolution ends up feeling a lot more earned as you're watching them like work together and overcome conflicts and actively better each other as people. Also the banter I think is better since they're not not good people. Like they actually have things that they can make fun of each other about. And in general, the book delivers there. Like I feel like the author really captured the classic rom-com banter pattern and kind of adapted it to a more modern setting. Speaking of which, this book is so fucking funny. Like it had me snapping pics and sending them to my best friend and harassing her constantly with rants about how good of a time I was having reading this, which I feel like if a romance novel makes you feel the need to discharge your emotions like that to somebody that you care about, like it has to be doing something right. I ended up giving this 4.5 stars just because I feel like there were a couple of areas in the book where I really missed seeing, I think some extra background that would have better explained why the characters were the way that they were. But honestly, it was so minor. And also this is a debut, which I think is insane. I feel like very ahead of the hype right now. I've never been in this position before, I don't think. I'm just so confident that this is going to blow up online. I know nothing about trends or why books are popular or why things succeed and fail. I am but an observer in this world, okay? But based on my experience as somebody who constantly rots my brain to the dulcet tones of my TikTok feed, which is mostly books, I just feel like this hits all of the right notes that the romance girlies are constantly freaking out over. And the vibes are just immaculate. I don't know, I love this. I thought it was really good. You should read it. Golden Sun and Morning Star. Dude, I'm so embarrassed by how long it took me to read this series. But in my defense, I feel like the marketing is purposefully vague because so many like very early plot points in book one, I would consider personally to be spoilers. So I just never had the faintest whisper of an idea what this was about or why people were feral about it on the internet or if it was worth my time other than a friend's recommendation, which should, should in theory be enough, but I'm a bad person. But take it from me, girl to girl slash not girl. If you're thinking about reading this series, you should do it. Okay, it's fire. It will hype you up like into the stratosphere with how intense it is all the way through. I gave the first book 4.5 stars and I read these other two while I was on vacation this month. They were the only things I read while I was away. I was basically allergic to books except these ones, which should already go to show you how much I liked them. And I gave them both five stars, which is not a common rating for me, okay? Things really have to like hit to get five stars from me. I don't give that out willy nilly. The series in general is about this boy named Darrow who works this incredibly dangerous job, basically as like a human drill bit kind of in the core of Mars. And he's mining out this mineral that he and his people are told will make the surface of Mars hospitable for all of humanity in this very unrealistic crazy far off future where we're killing earth and have to leave it because we've killed it so much. 
because we don't care about the climate or anything that's happening and it's becoming inhospitable to life. Not that that would ever happen to us. That would be crazy. Anyways, his job is like very noble, but as you can imagine, it's also incredibly dangerous and there are tons of casualties just all of the time. And on top of that, everybody also exists in this like super segregated society where everybody has a color assigned to them and an associated task that they're literally like genetically modified to be really good at doing. And the colors can range from reds like Darrow, who are mostly there to do labor, to golds, who are like big boy, super genius ruler types, to the obsidians, who are gigantic, like very physically strong soldiers, to the blues, who are these very like techie, smart spaceship operators. There's a ton more. There's like a shit ton of lore in this book, but it's presented in a way that's very easy to understand. Anyways, without getting into like why or how, as you might expect, based on this description so far, Dero realizes that things are not quite exactly as they seem. And he ends up becoming the only hope that his people have at like overcoming the bad system that's in place and hopefully just surviving and living in the future. It seems to be all up to our man. I'm really glad that I went into the series knowing functionally nothing because I was gagged reading these like multiple times. There are just so many moments in these books where I'm like, surely Pierce Brown will not go there. Surely that cannot be the direction of the plot in this moment. And whatever I'm worrying about, he just does the thing every single time. It was insane. Like this man has no concept of chill. I don't think it's an emotion that he has ever experienced. I don't think he knows what it is. Fair warning, these books are really dark and I can definitely see why, especially with the first book in the series, there are some negative interpretations of the choices that the author chose to make with the story, especially with the ways that the violence can be handled sometimes. But for me, I don't know. I feel like it worked with the kind of complicated and dark metaphor that Pierce Brown was clearly trying to weave about power and confederacy and how difficult it can be to try to attain and also hold on to the influence that you get. And just the really difficult decisions that you have to make as a leader. His decisions made sense to me, but still, yeah, I would recommend looking up trigger warnings for this book if you're worried about that. Anyways, I liked books two and three even more than the first book, which I thought at the time would be impossible. I think the strongest trait that this series has is its constant willingness to pivot. So many times, an interesting plot thread would be introduced that could easily span the entire book. And no, actually, like it'll last maybe 30 pages and then the story will just go in a completely different direction, like rinse and repeat throughout the entire series all of the time constantly. It gave me this feeling of like chronic whiplash and I love that in books. The prose in the series is very self-indulgent, very dramatic. I don't know, like there's a universe where I find that to be incredibly annoying, but however he did it, it just works, you know? Like this series just has an epic quality to it that makes even the smallest things that are happening in the plot feel just incredibly important all of the time. Not to mention that I sobbed in the third book. Most of the time when I say a book made me cry on Goodreads, I'm talking like it made me shed two, possibly three tears. A legitimate display of emotion. But this? I don't think I've been this upset in the book since I read Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. I cried for not exaggerating probably 10 minutes and then I had to put the book down. Like I couldn't keep going. I was too emotionally compromised. That's insane, you know, like that never happens for me. So yeah, I would recommend This Slays. I'll definitely be reading the new trilogy eventually. That takes place in the same world. I think it's all of the descendants of the original cast of characters. I'm a little skeptical of like what it's going to add since I, I thought that the original ending was incredibly satisfying, but people online say it's really good. So I'll be there. True biz. <sighs> This is maybe my disappointment of the year so far. I thought I was really going to love this. This is a book that takes place at a deaf academy that is told through three perspectives. One is a girl named Charlie, who is a transfer student with a cochlear implant, who's never met another deaf person before in her life. Two is a boy named Austin, who's the latest in a long and proud line of like pillars of the deaf community, who is reeling from the fact that his little sister has just been born hearing. And three is February, who is a coda, which is a child of deaf adults. And she's the headmaster. And she's just found out that the district is stripping funding away from the academy and closing it at the end of that year. I gave this 2.5 stars. I have some complicated feelings about this book because on one hand, I don't know if I've ever learned more reading fiction in a long time about a group of people that I have very little interaction with in my daily life. There are segments of this book that are between chapters that serve as kind of a guide to deaf culture and community and ASL. And there are just a lot of cool facts about how ASL can communicate things like tone and dialogue and tense that I found to be really, really cool. And in general, I thought the book was okay all the way through. Like the writing was fine. The characters were pretty well developed, especially since it's pretty hard to write teenagers, I think accurately when you're not a teenager, but the ending was bad. Bad. It was not good. Without spoiling it, basically it was a recreation of a famous historical event that ultimately does like nothing, or maybe it does, but we'll never know because the book just ends. There is just no closure on any of the plots, which are also ongoing. It's like somebody stole the last 30 pages of this manuscript from the author's office and just nobody noticed until it was already published. And now everybody has to pretend that it's always been this way. I was just really frustrated because I felt like the book, even though it was kind of boring, could have really come together in an interesting way. And instead it just veered off the highway, like entirely into a ditch, never to be seen again. On top of that, and also kind of related, there was a character in this book who just gave me an unbelievably big ick. And I assumed that eventually it would be dealt with somehow like by the narrative and then it just never was. And the character ended up being this like kind of positively important part of the bullshit ending. So yeah, that was two strikes, really took my opinion of the book down. I do feel kind of bad disliking it this much, especially given how effective I found it to be educationally, but dude, the ending just sucked that much. Like I don't know what else to say. The it girl. So I have this long standing feud with Ruth Ware. I talked about it before in one of my videos and I'll do it again, okay? The Death of Mrs. Westaway was one of the first ever thrillers that I read a couple of years ago. And I remember being like absolutely 
absolutely feral over it. I injected that book into my brain in less than a day. It has this like immaculate haunted house Victorian era, but in the modern day kind of atmosphere with the constant question of like, is this supernatural? What is reality? What is going on around me? And it just really kept you guessing. And I loved it. Okay, it's still my favorite thriller to this day. And obviously I've read like a lot of other thrillers in the time since. So anyways, after that experience, obviously I, a loyal woman, had to read her other books and all of them since then have just been so mid. It's been kind of this journey of self for me, trying to figure out if the death of Mrs. Westaway was, was actually even good or if it was just a mirage because I just feel gaslit if all of her other books have disappointed me this much. But anyways, I just keep reading them because I'm a crazy person and I have no respect for myself. I don't know why I keep doing this. Anyways, the it girl, what's it about? So this girl, Hannah, is a new student at Oxford and she ends up meeting this other girl named April who ends up becoming her roommate. Partway through that first year, April ends up dead and Hannah is the one who finds the body. And it is Hannah's eyewitness testimony that ends up convicting this like creepy burly man who works as a porter, which is British for like, campus security guard slash janitor, something like that. And fast forward like 20 years into the future and this guy has now died in prison. And Hannah in the modern day is contacted by this journalist who's digging into the case and is pretty sure that shock, things might not have been as they seem. She might've put the wrong guy in prison. What, who could have seen this coming? It's a thriller. So yeah, this book is dual timeline. Like you see Hannah in the past making friends and having a very like Ivy filled smart person time at Oxford. And then you also see her in the present day kind of like digging back into her past, trying to figure shit out. I ended up giving this 3.5 stars. I definitely liked it more than any of the other complete Ruth Ware duds that I've been reading in the past couple of years. The book is long, it's kind of slow and vibey, and it has a lot of Hannah just running around thinking like, wow, I'm so stressed and also pregnant and stressed out. And how could all of this be happening to me right now when I'm stressed and also pregnant? Isn't that crazy that I could be both of those things at the same time? That's so wild. Like a lot of pages were dedicated to that exact panic attack constantly. But what I think this book did well, even when it was kind of slow, was the classic mystery idea of it really could have been anyone. Every character basically feels like the clear culprit at some point in this book. I just like those cozy mystery vibes vibes of a true whodunit. Even though this is more of a thriller than a cozy mystery, I still I still got that energy and I thought that that was cool. So yeah, this didn't like outright disappoint me, which really is all that she needed to do in order to get 3.5 stars. It didn't like knock my socks off, but I am slightly further away now from egging her house, which is a definite improvement of where I was prior to starting this book. So take that as you will. Writers and lovers. I felt so drawn to this book this month. I don't even know what it was. I mean, like the cover is very nice. Like that's sexy. Look at those lines. But when I say that this was just staring at me, like whenever I pass my bookshelf, I feel like I never had a choice. You know, I was always going to read this this month. It's a book about a writer named Casey who's trying to finish her debut novel. This woman is many thousands of dollars in debt. She is actively grieving the recent death of her mother. She's just gone through a breakup. She's working a job that she absolutely despises. And she's also juggling two new relationships with two very different men. And this book is just her kind of trying to figure out what the fuck her life is. It's very slow. There's not much of a plot and it's mostly focused on just fleshing out the dynamics between Casey and of course, all of these characters in her life, like these men, her friends, etc. But more than that, honestly, like her relationship with her own creativity and her work and her book. The writing in this book is absolutely gorgeous without being pretentious at all, in my opinion. And I ended up liking this like a lot more than I thought I would going in. I gave it four stars. The author did a really good job of making me feel like I was there with Casey the entire time. And I found it really easy to understand why she made the decisions that she made, which made her easy to identify with. And the arc of her story is really good. Like I found it to be a very heartwarming book by the end, which you wouldn't expect from literary fiction normally. It's like there to make you cry and be sad and morose, but this did not do that. And if you like those like slower paced, more amusing, thoughtful books, I think that you're really going to end up enjoying this one, especially for its depiction of grief and how that kind of interacts with the creative process. It's just really good. Speech team. So this was the other arc I read this month, even though it's already out. I am in fact the laziest person in the galaxy. So I accepted this because I was like a notorious insufferable speech and debate kid in high school. I feel like this will not surprise you. I feel like I still kind of, for better or for worse, exude this Energy. Speech and debate was like theater for kids who can't act and also base their entire self-worth on their academic achievements. So I fit right in. I don't know, I loved it, okay? It was very formative. It was like a lot of what I did with my free time during high school. Talk to Walls Gang. Poorly tailored business clothes we grew out of three years ago, but still wear gang. Anyways, this book is an account of four adults who I believe are in their 40s during the time that the book takes place. And they all end up reconnecting following the suicide of somebody that all of them knew from speech team in high school. And in this guy's suicide note, he talked about an abusive remark that was made to him by the coach of their speech team in high school that had followed him all the way up until he died. And these four adults who are now reconnecting all realized that they were all verbally abused in some capacity by their coach as well. And of course it was the 80s when all of that happened. So none of them told anybody because why would you, I guess, at that time period. But nowadays the four of them make a pact to go to Florida where this coach has retired and kind of confronts them with the weight of what he did to all of them during their time with the team. I gave this a 2.5. I thought it was pretty mid. It's the kind of short book that feels very, very long. Like it's less than 300 pages, but it feels like the majority of it is either these very lush lilting descriptions of like trees 
things or places that they're in, or alternatively repetitions of like character A going and having an intense conversation with character B and then returning after learning something, and then repeat that again but with character C and then returning and learning something, but then repeat that again but with character D, and it's all just the same conversation kind of over and over again because they're learning very similar things every time. And just very little happens plot-wise, it ends up being more of a character study of these four people who are all confronting that coach, and all of them are likable for the most part, but the, like the book just goes nowhere. It has the start to some pretty interesting conversations, I feel, but there is just no depth at all to be found. And it feels like the central theme of the book ends up being the motivational quote on the pillow in your mom's living room that says like, be kind for everybody is fighting a battle that you know nothing about, which just feels so reductive given the weight of what actually happens and is done and is said in this book. It ends up almost feeling like a gotcha, like you were having asshole thoughts, weren't you? Don't do that, that's really mean. You shouldn't feel that way, which is kind of patronizing. It ends up just making the entire book feel pretty hollow, I think, by the end. Flap when you land. So this is a young adult contemporary book that is written in verse, as you can see, and it follows these two teenagers. One is in New York City and one is in the Dominican Republic, and they're both reeling after finding out not only that their dad died in a tragic plane crash flying from New York to the DR, but also that he was one of those just like really cool, hip, awesome parents who secretly had two families the entire time. Just really cool, normal dad behavior. You know how it is. And yeah, this book is about them dealing with this new information and just also recovering from the blow that their father's death did to their lives. This is is probably the first book I've ever read in verse. That kind of feels like a lie, but I think it's true. Um, I loved it. It's super lyrical, probably as you'd expect, but it's still written like a book, if that makes sense. Like it wasn't too much poem to the point where I wasn't able to follow the story or I was getting lost in the sauce. That never happened. The way it was structured was pretty cool. Like it's dual POV with both daughters and one of the girls, her sections are written in triplets and the other one, her sections are written in couplets, which really helped me differentiate between the two characters, which I feel like might have been hard otherwise. It is a really raw depiction of what it's like to know just absolutely nothing about the people that you love the most in the entire world. And it was that on top of a brutal representation of how grief can just eat away at your soul and at your family and at your relationships with the people that you love that are left. And it was also a pretty brutal look at living in poverty, like especially for YA, I think, because the girl in the DR lives in the pretty rough neighborhood and she has like no idea how she will ever leave or be able to break the cycle that has trapped so many of her loved ones in her town now that her dad can't send any more checks from America given the fact that he's dead. And yeah, I give it four stars. I don't really have any negative to say about this book. Like I really liked it, obviously. It made me cry, which while a low bar is still something. It just didn't really hit me, hit me in the five starsy kind of way, but that's okay. Not every book has to do that. It was still really good. I would definitely recommend it. So you've been publicly shamed. So this is a really interesting book, in my opinion. It is a nonfiction book that's about cancel culture, except it was written before the term cancel culture was even invented, which gives it a weird amount, I think, of foresight and relevance about what was to come. It's all about the concept of public shaming and what happens when the internet frequently Twitter in the book, but it can happen, I guess, anywhere, dogpiles on someone and ruins their life, which as a concept is not something that could have happened at all, really, even 20 years ago to somebody who wasn't already a celebrity. So definitely it's worth thinking about. The internet has a lot of power. And I think that most people don't at all think about it and their part in it, because at the end of the day, each individual is only a fraction of a percent of whatever movement or trend is occurring. And of course, removing one person from anything kind of does nothing. So why would I feel that anything I could do or say could actually have a significant impact? You know, I, I feel like that's the kind of general thought, but the sum action of everybody thinking that way and then doing things together thinking that they don't individually matter is just gigantic. And I think this book does a pretty good job of pointing out the startling impact that this can have on people who at the end of the day make some pretty minor mistakes and then end up having to like live in squalor because they can never be employed again and develop serious trauma as a result of what happened to them and just suffer punishments that don't suit whatever like vaguely off color joke that they made once on Twitter to their five followers. Like that does happen to people and it's important to be mindful of, I think. I don't even have a truly massive platform or anything, but something that I am still very cognizant of is I'll get hate comments or flame about how I look or my takes or something, but I will never respond or highlight them in any way, not because I don't have jokes to make or because I don't have confidence in my ability to dunk on a fucking nerd. Like I do, okay? With even a fraction of my real power, you would be gone. But I don't want to accidentally end up sending any well-meaning followers of mine to go and harass somebody who chances are has zero people in their corner, is likely 12 and probably hates themselves more already if they're yelling at random strangers on the internet than I could possibly imagine. Highlighting that kind of behavior and defending myself from it, from a position as somebody with a platform is just adding unnecessary cruelty into the world and essentially accomplishing nothing at the end of the day. But not everyone does that, you know? Like I don't think everybody realizes necessarily the impact that their platform can have. This is only one example, but Cindy made a great video recently that talks about some drama that happened on BookTok with this big creator who made a lot of content that was thirsting after this hockey player. And initially it seemed like he and his family were cool with it, but eventually his wife comes out and says that she's not actually comfortable with it after all. And that creator, I feel, just had no concept of how many 
many like absolutely rabid fans that she had that would leap to her defense. And this poor wife of this player is just a gal, you know, like she has no one. And now not only does she have to deal with the original conflict, she also has like a legion of people in every comment section of every post that she has in her account, including in pictures of her family that are just like yelling at her and calling her names and saying awful things. I don't know, there's more to it than that, obviously. I don't think that the creator intended for that to happen, but that really goes to show like the unknown influence that people can wield online and how easy it is as a random person to just be a part of something that you don't realize could really be like causing severe stress. Anyways, in this book, John takes a stance that is very compassionate, I think, towards people who experience this kind of mass online shaming. And it's a good book in general. It's funny, it's smart. It asks important questions that we should be reckoning with as responsible users of the internet. And I gave it four stars as a result. But the part that I don't like is if you take the general philosophy of this book and apply it broadly, right? It's missing the other side of the coin, which is that I think one of the best things to come out of the internet is its ability to call attention to injustice that for whatever reason cannot be dealt with legally. And the examples in this book are just not very serious. For the most part, there are one-time mistakes that are clearly blown out of proportion in comparison to the amount of harm that they actually caused. But in the real world, outside of these cherry-picked examples, I feel in things like the Me Too movement or a lot of what Black Lives Matter sought to accomplish online, the internet can be a fantastic tool to highlight injustice that will not otherwise be punished by society. And in this book, there's just no mention of that and of how we should be holding people accountable, especially public figures and people who seriously victimize other people. And in fairness, again, I think that this book was written pretty ahead of its time, but I still wish there was something there because I think it would have rounded out the discussion of nuance in this book really well. Loveless. I absolutely love Radio Silence, another book by this author. It was recommended to me like years ago by Paperback Dreams, May She Rest in Peace. And it's one of my favorite YA contemporary books because it really just reminds me of the kind of girl that I was when I was 17 and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do for the rest of my life forever and who I wanted to be. Not that I'm any closer to knowing those things five years later. I'm not, but whatever, don't worry about it. Anyways, I also really like Heartstopper, which if you're living under the biggest rock in the Northern Hemisphere is just a disgustingly cute queer graphic novel series. This is the oldest news ever. There's never been any news older than this news I'm about to share right now, but it was also made into a Netflix show and the series is really good. I would strongly recommend. Alice's books in general are all coming of age stories that center around queer characters and just figuring out not only your identity, but also your personality and your general goals and ambitions for your future. Loveless very much follows that formula. It is about this girl named Georgia who attends college and meets a bunch of people and just goes on her own kind of hero's journey of figuring out that she is aromantic asexual. Disclaimer, that is not a set of identities that you really ever see explored by popular books. And I just want to say that solely on that basis, I can totally see why this book was so important for so many people. And I have a lot of compassion for anybody who felt super represented by this story. With the criticisms I have, I don't want to take away from what I see that this book has done for people. Like it's, it's just my opinion. Because unfortunately, this is the first book I've read by Alice that just didn't really work for me. I gave it a honestly pretty kind three stars. It had some good moments for sure. Like there was a part that made me cry. I liked some of the relationships between some of the characters. And it was easy to read all the way through. Like Alice is also very good about that in their books. But Georgia, the main character is just this really bizarre combination of on one hand, on page selfish and unlikable and just kind of a bad friend. And on the other hand, almost like mythologized by all of the other characters in this book as this just like wonderful person, can't possibly imagine my life without you type friend. Which you see in how they talk about her and how they act towards her, especially when she's kind of like messing up and falling into some of her character flaws. And that just rubbed me the wrong way. Like I don't think we really saw a lot of on page evidence of the positive things that her friends were saying about her. And because of that, a lot of Georgia's bad behavior was just forgiven during the book by everybody around her on the merit of her past actions, which again, like we're not seeing. And she ends up facing like very few consequences for anything that she does. I also thought that some of the side characters were pretty shallowly represented. In particular, there is a non-binary asexual person who kind of just exists in the book to be Georgia's asexual Wikipedia page and doesn't really have an arc of their own. And Alice is normally really good at that, I think, with making all of their characters feel like actual people that are living and breathing in the world and are more than just the sum of all of their different identities. But I didn't really get that in this book with a lot of the characters, which kind of sucked. So yeah, it just didn't really work for me, unfortunately, being mortal. First of all, the way that we treat old people is like very sad. This book talks a lot about how unethical nursing homes are as like habitats for the elderly. And it's more so an argument for communities that give old people access to things like living creatures other than a visit every other week from the only family member that hasn't forgotten that you exist. And you know, the ability to make any decisions at all for themselves instead of just being trapped in old person jail. And I don't know, it's like depressing to read in this book about how rare those things can be. But eventually if like the world doesn't end, you know, like we're gonna be the old people. I probably speak for both of us when I say that I would rather be in a place with like plants and parrots and shit than in a sad gray room waiting to die. But apart from that section, which I thought was very sad, but also kind of important to think about. The most interesting part of this book for me was its discussion on how we treat terminally ill patients in the months and years approaching their death. So the author has been a doctor for like many, many years. And he highlights this really important natural conflict that exists in modern medicine between doing everything that we possibly can to save a patient's life, even when the odds are like quickly approaching, you know, single decimal points. And on the other hand, ensuring that that person's life is actually still worth living even as they approach death. So what I mean by that is that when somebody is dying of sickness, 
there are typically like a million different experimental things or types of chemotherapy, et cetera, et cetera, that you can try and that that person and their family will probably want to try because as a society, we're just really bad at confronting the concept of our own mortality. But past a certain point, it quickly approaches like one in a million that you're actually going to live or that the experimental treatment will do anything. And because we are so fixated on that one in a million being us, people will keep trying these treatments that almost certainly aren't going to work and are also tearing apart their bodies with side effects at a greater rate than whatever their original illness was doing. And then they die sad and in pain and probably in debt because God bless America. <laughs> Just all of that instead of spending those last months of time with our friends and our family doing things that we actually like to do. I don't blame people for struggling with this. Like I think that if I were dying, which not gonna what I'm not to my knowledge, I too would not be able to deal. Like I would assume that I'm the protagonist who overcomes the odds and I'd probably do all of the super risky treatments past the point of no return. But I feel like that's proof that as a culture, we just have a lot of work to do in terms of becoming more comfortable having conversations about when to give up and be realistic and actually enjoy the time that we have left instead of like ransacking our body with treatments that aren't actually doing anything. Really sad, yeah. I I mean, that's heavy stuff, but I thought that this book was very important and I gave it 4.5 stars. And that's a wrap of my books for August. Um, I'm feeling good, feeling well read, feeling educated, feeling at peace now that I filmed this video. If you like this video, you should catch me back here pretty soon because for the first time in my life, I'm not going back to school this September and I don't know what to do with myself. So I'll be here and please definitely let me know in the comments if you've read anything like particularly interesting to you this month. I am always looking for new recommendations. And yeah, please remember to like and subscribe. And that's it, I'll see you later. Nothing else, bye.